there's nobody who can tell you, you know, this is the blueprint for success. I'm Bethel Aqua. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at Penn State University. Been here for about three and a half years now. In academia, my role is sort of a person with many hats as a young assistant professor. So somebody who I think is a mentor to students, uh, a mentor for research projects, somebody who's maybe a go-to for younger colleagues seeking advice. Um, somebody who is on a multitude of committees with a little bit of leadership roles in there. And also to some degree, you know, the, the professor hats in terms of educating. I don't think I ever grew up wanting to be in, a scientist, but I knew I liked biology and I knew I liked a lot of that stuff. I would say when I was really young, I was convinced that I argued the best with my brother and I wanted to be a lawyer. When I kind of went to high school, um, I had a sense that I wanted to be a high school biology teacher. I went to undergrad with that in mind. I picked a school that would, that I knew crafted really good teachers in our area. I went to a small undergrad institution, Le Moyne College in Syracuse, New York. And I started research as a freshman, like my second semester. And I worked naturally for the only person I knew in the department, the person who was teaching me Gen Chem. And so naturally the first thing I did was made compounds I could barely spell out, pronounce and draw. I love the idea of solving a puzzle. I liked the idea of not having everybody tell you exactly what you had to do. So one downside of doing research while taking, for instance, organic lab is in doing research, you didn't have to stick to a blueprint, but in organic lab you did. So there are things like that where there's a really clear contrast and the reason I mentioned that is those two things are also academia and industry. So this is kind of something that even at the early onset probably makes sense why I'm not in industry at the minute. And after about a year and a half of that experience when I was in organic, I decided that I wanted to do more organic research, um, like making carbon-carbon bonds sounded cool. So I ended up doing an REU uh, the summer after my second year. I actually ironically, uh, hated the REU program to some extent because the background was really different. I it made me it made me think that I didn't want to go to grad school, um, but obviously I did, right? Because here I am to some degree. Uh, there were just experiences that were different than what I had in my small undergrad, which is to be expected when you go to another program. And then uh, my organic research went for another year and a half as an undergrad, so. I left undergrad having done all synthetic chemistry. My um, I'd end up taking a year off before I went to grad school. So in my year off, I worked with polymers and I never really knew anything about them, um, but a related school close by a SUNY environmental science and forestry was looking for somebody who was like an organic background. And they were looking for people to make perfluoropolymers. So I ended up doing that for a year before grad school. Um, and I had actually gone, applied to grad school for that year and ended up just deferring for the year with the idea I was gonna take this job and just get a little more experience. So then I went to Iowa and joined the group that was doing natural product synthesis. Um, I really enjoyed it, but after a semester I had had enough. I think the group was that I was in, I really liked. Um, it was the most closely related to what I was doing as an undergrad and coming from a small undergrad, we're exposed to such few topics. So in undergrad, if you go to a school like I did, organic chemistry is natural products. Uh, physical chemistry is, is somehow electrochemistry. You know, biochemistry is just proteins and, and DNA. Um, you're sort of like pigeonholed into the really broad fundamental areas, but not the contemporary ones. And he was very receptive, although I think, you know, I think there's always uh, this was what I really thought was going to happen. And I didn't expect that that was going to happen to switch groups. The person whose group I joined was ultimately very supportive, too. 
And so I had joined a solid state chemistry group after that. Um, my thought was grad school was your last chance to really learn something new. And as long as I was still doing synthesis and not, for instance, hardcore physical chemistry or analytical chem chemistry, I was probably going to enjoy it. So I joined Marcus Vex's group at NYU, worked on supramolecular polymer chemistry, uh, learned how to synthesize polymers, learned about ring opening metathesis polymerization, things that were still like organic, organometallic related. Um, worked on cyclophanes, which was interesting because I also worked on them as a PhD student. Some things like that, that kind of traced the lineage back to other things I had worked on. Um, that's a great question. Um, I would say for postdocs going out to academia, probably one of the biggest sets of advice I could give you is don't give up. Um, you know, I think it's when you, when you apply for jobs at different programs, it's not always, um, it's not always crystal clear what people are looking for. And I think even when departments are looking for a certain type of chemist or biologist or scientist, let's say, it doesn't mean that you're not applicable or that you won't get a favorable vote. Um, oftentimes it just means that they have, you know, an idea in mind of what would be ideal for them but they also probably would consider anybody that would strengthen their department in the end. Along that same line, if you are applying to a program that you know, on paper doesn't have a certain research interest that you're somebody who uh, wields that expertise, make it really, really um, you know, blatantly obvious for lack of a better way to say it of how your expertise can enhance their department. So if this person were to come to our department, what would they do to enhance it? And that may not just be your individual proposals, that might be overall. In terms of trying to think about your potential fit in a department, uh, realize that departments probably aren't gonna look for people who are replete in, in research ideas. Most difficult part of transitioning, I think was the second part of the question. Part of it is there's no blueprint for you. Um, there's not somebody, you know, you're always used to as a PhD student or a postdoc, you have an advisor. And if you go uh, astray somehow, your advisor's gonna tell you what to do. But when you come to the department realistically, and this is what actually happened to me, you're given a key to your office and your lab, and you're given an account number, and that's it. And you're not told what to do because what you might do might be different than someone else's. That's not to say that you can't ask people for advice. Myself and a lot of people, you know, we talk to our postdoc advisors or PhD advisors, oftentimes because they know us very well. It could maybe give ideas of, you know, if you're in this spot here, how would you respond and kind of help you? Um, but kind of like I said, no one could tell you you know, you need 20 papers, two federally funded grants and five awards or whatever to do it. So it's not that there's a quantity that you have to reach, it's more trying to figure out how to have good visibility in the end. Being an assistant professor is, is in itself a large challenge because I think, you know, realistically, you don't know what's required for funding. You don't know how to publish papers even though you've been on papers before. But most people come in with a mindset that I was successful as a PhD student or postdoc, so this should be a no-brainer. But you're also working in groups that are well-established. And even if you're working for a brand new assistant professor, they have some idea of what's going on. And so if you're in a spot where everything is a well-oiled machine and works really well, when you jump to start your own group, you don't have that. So one of the biggest challenges is to probably realize that for a couple of years, it's going to be really slow. You'll be your best postdoc, you'll be your best graduate student. And on top of being like a partial PhD student or postdoc, you have to do all of the other things that are required for you. There are a lot of things that you don't anticipate that you don't have control of. You know, so for instance, relevant to our center, it's very difficult to think of where you're at a spot where you're a co PI on something and then your lead PI passes away, 
the science and the intellectual genesis of the project's not around. And you and the others have to, and the entire team have to still kind of like get up and understand a lot really quickly. I think if you could ever be in a good spot for that to happen, uh, we were because we have a good team of students and postdocs and people who got knowledge very quickly and are very coherent with it. Um, but I think that's something where, you know, that was John to me was a really good mentor, a really good friend. And those aren't things that you could replace very easily. So I think if you're someone like me, that's a little bit more planning often uh, where you can see like a year downstream, these might be the group goals and things like that, that it's a little bit difficult when things that you don't plan for happen to sort of disrupt you. So that's kind of like, like I said, there have been, you know, there's also the challenge of being a woman in chemistry uh, in organic chemistry or in polymer chemistry where there aren't that many people. Um, so there are all of those things I think compound everything, but that doesn't make it insurmountable either. I would say initially you would think teaching is a hard hat to wear because even if you've been a TA, it's not the same. So in a similar realm, a TA always has an advisor. Or so I think initially teaching is something where you feel like you don't know what you're doing and you may not know somebody in the department that's taught the course before that could help you. So for me, that's the scenario that emerged here. Um, so I think initially that was the hat that I was a little bit scared about. But as you knew, like research was going to be on a halt until you had students. And for me, my first semester was teaching and my second semester was setting up the lab my hat moved pretty quickly to being more unsure about research and picking students. Um, so first off, I'm definitely an introvert. Um, most of my closest friends and colleagues and things like this are as well. I think maybe just knowing if you know that you identify that way or you would be that way, trying to think about ways in which you could still gain meaningful connections to people is probably one of the like one of the harder things to think about but one of the more uh, integral things but i do think being an assistant professor is kind of lending it's difficult maybe to be introverted and be an assistant professor because it also makes you perhaps less likely to seek out advice from other people it's probably is a catch-22 word but i would probably say competitive is the word i would use and i think competitive usually has a negative connotation Right. If people are competitive, uh, you know, the first thing you think of is like a battlefield and you have to win and you have to be the one surviving in the end. Um, I don't think of it in that regard. I think of it in terms of like a motivational detail. So if you're competitive, but what, what kind of motivates you is the idea of trying to find a way to optimize and be on top um, is sort of how I think it is. Career. You know, you kind of want to go into areas where you don't feel like they're highly competitive, where if you are competitive, you could stick out a little bit. But you also want to uh, be in a field where things are really interesting. And one of the ways to make new science or cool science is to sort of take two boring ideas and mesh them together. Another idea is to take two areas that have never met uh, and push them together. And I think that's what our group does a lot of science in general is thinking about areas with a different mindset. And so a lot of the things we do, nanothread wise, for instance, the reason John and I were a really good synthetic team together is we thought about it differently. And so it allowed the nanothreads or the ways in which we approach the chemistry or the science to be a little bit more numerous. And Before COVID, um, my day was normally, so I'm, I am a morning person. So my day pre-COVID would normally be waking up pretty early, um, about, uh, I don't know, probably like 4.30 or so. And what I would do is uh, wake up for a half an hour, plan the day. And then I would often, at least here, go to the intramural building and be there when they opened around six and stay there for an hour and a half or so. 
Um, and by the time I would hit my office around 7.30 or 8 o'clock, I would feel insanely productive. So I had just gone and exercised and gotten out of a lot of either anxiety or nervous energy. And I also spent a half an hour before to plan my day. So that was one big thing, uh, even on the weekends, that I think was really helpful because you do like to have some semblance of work-life balance. Post-pandemic, uh, it's a little bit more, I guess, stochastic. I still try to plan things where maybe I have in my calendar X hours to this or at this time this, but it's been a little bit more difficult um, to have an actual pattern there. I was, so the first hobby I ever had was actually figure skating. So I was a figure skater up and through about, I would say maybe into seventh grade or eighth grade. Um, I was pretty good too, actually, but I didn't keep it much longer in, in high school. Um, in high school, I got into basketball and soccer. Um, and then those became fun avenues to, you know, meet new people, to have weekend activities and things like this. Um, most of those have carried on. Actually, last year, Margaret hinted at this before, last year because of COVID was the first year that I haven't played soccer to some level anywhere. Um, since COVID started, I've become a little bit more of a, like it takes me an hour longer to walk to work because I like to enjoy the outdoors more. Uh, things like this where it just becomes important to get some fresh air, to get some exercise and things like this. So I think being focused and finding the right environment probably is critical. Since the pandemic started and, and since being a new pet owner, uh, trying to be trying to optimize my day has been probably really helpful. So for instance, saying I'm going to the office only for three hours, what can I possibly get done in the three hours to make those the most optimal and efficient possible? Um, I think going for walks really helps. So if you're working, you know, basically sitting down at a desk or an office for five, six, seven hours in a row is, is not gonna be helpful. At some point you are going to lose focus um, and your efficiency or your optimization process, if you want to keep it sort of synthetically oriented, is going to be really low. And so going for a walks, um, trying to break up the day with other activities has been good. One of the things that I've done recently is try to decouple certain activities from certain environments. So like when I go home for the day, there might be some things that I could do. Of course, the pandemic has made it a little bit more going across these boundaries a little bit. Um, but when I started, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever write papers home. Um, I wouldn't write proposals home. I could do teaching activities because they were a little bit different. Um, I could grade exams, I could grade papers, I could respond to emails, but I tried to limit the things that were more high level, high capacity activities to being physically in my professional setting. And uh, I would say that's helpful because then you're, you know, you get into a routine where your brain associates certain activities or certain work environments. Um, one of the strategies is also, I guess, related to finding where's the best spot for you to do that activity. So for the longest time here, I found the most optimal place for me to do writing was actually somewhere that's not my office. At least for us at the onset of COVID, I think for me, I initially thought all of the students in my group, whether this was true or not, I instantly felt that everybody would feel like their development would be stunted when it was clear that COVID wasn't just gonna be a month or two month thing. So part of internalizing that for me was thinking, okay, what can students do a little bit more remotely to feel like they're getting progress and, and be in a good spot to develop still. And so that's kind of where we took the few steps back and thought about what papers we could write up and what things we could do with more limited time in lab if that's what it came to. But I'm sure there are groups or other spots or other professors that are maybe in different scenarios too. So one of the things that I like about academia is 
you know, perhaps you're being judged on your application packet with your research ideas and your creativity. Um, but to use the analogy really in a weird way, once you get in the door with your proposals, you can be an organic chemist on paper, but if you come here and want to be a computational chemist, you're fine. So nobody can tell you, you know, this is what you propose, this is what you have to do. It's all about what you feel. Yeah, so there's, you know, the other aspect of being an academic that's lost a little bit. There's a couple actually. Um, if when we stop recording, I wanted to go run a reaction right now, I could do that. It's a Sunday. Uh, I can walk in the lab if I want. I can train students. I can help them. And there's the development of and mentoring students too. So in industry, some positions you're offered some bench time and then eventually you become more managerial and you don't have the ability to do experiments as much anymore. You're more of a director. So those roles are a little bit less uh, distilled out and are more seamless here. So you can still go in the lab when you want to. You can certainly enjoy helping students develop um, and instilling them a love of research and things like this too. I think in industry, those are, it's not that they aren't there. Um, I think if you, you know, if you work for Merck's discovery team or processing team or something, you're gonna have those avenues still. But there's something about being involved with students who are still trying to decide what career path they want. That's personally rewarding too. This video was produced by the Center for Nanothread Chemistry. In an effort to promote an inclusive and equitable research environment, postdocs and graduate students receive the opportunity to interview a senior scientist in the center to nurture new professional relationships during an informal chat with guided discussion questions. Their discussion was recorded, edited, and posted to share their advice, experience in science, scientific challenges, and more.